Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nicole with the Sentencing Project, and we're here this afternoon to talk about voting in jail, strategies to expand democracy. Morgan, can you go to the next slide, please? So we're gonna, I'm gonna be joined today, I'm moderating a discussion with colleagues across the country, including Ms. Pauline Rogers with the REACH Foundation Mississippi, Jarrell Douglas in my hometown of Houston, Justin Cooper out in Colorado and Denver, and Dana Piaski, who works with the Campaign Legal Center, a national organization that's based in DC. We're gonna have a conversation this afternoon about voting in jail efforts, ongoing efforts, and then also talk about new ways that folks on this call can establish efforts in their jurisdictions to support voting in jail for the incarcerated this year and for ongoing reforms um, in the future. Next slide, please. So today's conversation builds on a report that the Sentencing Project published a few weeks ago, Voting in Jails, and two of our presenters today, their work is featured in the report, specifically the work out of Houston and Denver, and then the conversation this afternoon will be amplified by the work that will be highlighted in Mississippi, and then Dana will bring in additional national context. In the Voting in Jails report that the Sentencing Project published a few weeks ago, we also highlight best practices from other jurisdictions around the country that have gotten you know, great recognition in recent years and weeks, including the work out of Chicago and Los Angeles, where those county jails are currently polling locations. And in recent primaries, incarcerated persons were able to actually go to the polls in those locations and vote in the election and will continue to serve as primary locations, or I'm sorry, as polling locations going into the general election. Of course, much of this conversation will be updated this afternoon given COVID-19 and the pandemic and the way that civic organizations, including those represented on the call today and the work that you all might be doing across the country has shifted and will need to shift given the need to protect each of ourselves and incarcerated folks from community spread related to the coronavirus and other challenges that may be surfacing in the midst of COVID-19 and other issues that are developing and ongoing in 2020. I, liked, I would like to refer you to the Voting in Jails report that you can find at the Sentencing Project website, sentencingproject.org. One of the main issues that spurred this report and previous reports that the Sentencing Project um, has done is that there's little attention paid to eligible voters who are incarcerated on any given election who can vote. Even election practitioners um, may not be fully aware of the policies and practices in their jurisdiction. And so hopefully this conversation will be the start of an ongoing discussion between now and the general election. This conversation builds upon work that will be highlighted this afternoon. And Dana and I are offering to serve as resources for ongoing efforts in new jurisdictions and new cities and counties around the country that want to establish their own voting in jail um, efforts. So this slide highlights a few of the key um, takeaways from the report that was published a few weeks ago and you can find on our website including not just efforts in Denver and Houston, but also in Chicago, LA, Los Angeles, uh, DC, and Philadelphia, as well as trends related to voting in jails, such as those polling locations in the Cook County Jail in Chicago and also in Los Angeles. So with that, um, we'll move on to the panelists this afternoon. I've already introduced um, the four panelists, including Ms. Pauline, who is with the REACH Foundation out of Mississippi. Ms. Pauline is a formerly incarcerated individual who has for many years led reentry efforts in Mississippi, including voting rights efforts for the incarcerated. So with that, um, we'll go to Ms. Pauline who will share with us what is going on in Mississippi. Good afternoon. Um, I'm thankful for the Citizen Project and all the other panelists. Uh, I only have a few minutes here so much but my experience, like Nicole has already said, my, my position is being formally incarcerated is where my perspective comes from. And so my approach to doing the voting is somewhat different. If, if you've ever been heard of people being incarcerated, we have a way of 
how can I say this, the roundabouts, every city has a roundabout. So for being formerly incarcerated, I use all of the roundabout ways to doing this work and approaching it. And for me, it is important in all of us to know who our stakeholders are in our cities, in our communities, be it from the religious sector, uh, knowing who your Baptist leads are, your Presbyterians, your Methodists, your whatever, your Muslims, your uh, even your atheist population, because the goal is to get people registered and voting. And then the other thing is to pay attention to all of the races. Uh, locate out in, in my state, I know all the notary publics, you want to get yourself positioned so that when you get ready to do this work, all of the I's have been dotted and the T's crossed. Notify your Secretary of State's office what you're going to do and let them know about prisoners' rights to vote. Oh, and then have all of your sheriffs involved. Know who the sheriff, who is in charge of, or who the president is in the sheriff's association, because you want to get all these people involved. And then you you cross all your T's and dot your I's with your local sheriff to start with, and then you spread about by knowing in your county, like every 82 counties in the state of Mississippi, I know who the sheriffs are. I know who who's friendly with voting rights. And every time the election changes, make sure that you get those people on board to help you in the process of uh, getting people to vote. But if you use the stakeholders, some of them can get access quicker to people, <clears throat> excuse me, than we can. And then notify the members family members of your loved ones to get them engaged and involved in the voting process. I have a team of people that have been certified in the prison to get data from prisoners. At the end of every year, our organization do um, an angel tree project. Well, I don't like to use that word angel tree anymore because we are rolling out our own national uh, model, but we get data and the information from the uh, prisoner get that contact information and we contact them personally. We have one of the universities, uh, Jackson State University that calls all these families. So that's just a starting point for how we do what we do to get people to vote. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Pauline. And we're gonna have time for Q&A and discussion at the end of the call um, this afternoon, but I wanna encourage participants to ask any questions in the Q&A portion, and then we'll try to get to them um, before the end of the webinar. So now we're going to go to Darrell, um, to Darrell, I'm sorry, Darrell, um, who's with the Houston Justice Coalition um, in my hometown. And Darrell has been doing voter in jail work for many years, where he uh, started when he co-founded the Houston Justice Coalition and has done a great deal of work um, in Harris County related to this. So Darrell is gonna talk to us this afternoon about how things got started in Harris County in the Houston area, and then also what ongoing efforts he and his colleagues in Houston are doing this year to support voting and jail efforts. So Darrell, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Awesome. So first of all, thank everybody for being here and thank you for the opportunity to get to be part of this panel. Uh, to really understand kind of where Houston Justice came about, um, our current work with uh, me working for Spread the Vote and kind of uh, how that work has changed, we got to start with how I even came into the work. And I'm pretty sure when I tell my story within my allotted time, uh, my story may sound a lot like yours. So um, coming out of high school in a single family home with my mom, my brother and me, and I knew I couldn't go off to college somewhere in a brick and mortar. Uh, and so I went to school online and I got a job as a correctional officer working for the Texas prison system. And uh, over the course of five years, I got to hear so many stories, meet so many of the recurring visitors. They almost felt like my family members because I would see them every weekend. Um, and then I started to see sort of these least common denominators or these least common denominated factors that often led to people being in, in, in prison. And uh, that sort of led to, I did, I did a five year flat sentence. I left as a lieutenant 
in uh, 2011, and it was my goal. My North Star is basically building a world where more people are on this side of the bar than on the other, and there's a lot of work that we have to do, and I think a lot of it does come from voting. So we essentially started in 2017 with the idea to go into the county jail and register voters. Um, we sat down and we came up with a plan. We thought about what that might look like before presenting it to the sheriff. Um, being that I knew some of the lingo and I kind of knew where some of his uh, questions or some of his concerns were going to be. And so we put that into the initial uh, presentation that we did and everything sort of went smoothly. Um, after that, it came down to time to realizing how are we actually going to make this work? Because at the Harris County Jail, they don't do mass movements, so they don't have a chow hall. They, they're in dormitories, and it's set. They eat, they do everything in there. And so the idea became, are we going to be able to bring free world volunteers in, get them trained, and go from pod to pod or dorm to dorm and register these voters? And after some back and forth and figuring out exactly what that would look like, that is essentially what ended up happening. So twice a year, we would we team up with the local county structure here. They already have sort of these trainings, because in Texas, you have, to, you have to go through a training and get a certificate in order to register voters. So those already existed, but we knew that in the communities like the one that I grew up in, a lot of people aren't going to go downtown and pay for parking and wait and sit through this long like meeting and it was shutting a lot of people out so we kind of said can we do this our way keep the same content but kind of rick it rick it remix it a little bit so we, i can get some of my neighbors to sit through this and actually be part of that change and uh, our local elected officials took that chance and it's been amazing so we have voter registration training kickbacks right and it, it, it has totally changed the way that our recruitment and what ends up happening in the jail um, happen. So we go through those training and then leading up to voter reg the voter registration deadline here in Texas, each of those deadlines for each election, that's kind of what we use. Um, we do four Sundays preceding that deadline and we go in. And one of, I'll tell you, one of my funnest, one of the funnest things that I look forward to is these people have signed up for this, but then they get there and they gotta like go through the metal detector and leave their phone in the locker and like all this stuff. And when we go through the gates and then they get that first click clank, I love the look on their eyes. Because, and then I love to see on the way out the smiles because this is a two-way street. I remember uh, there's one of our volunteers, Margie, she would go and uh, when she would give the guys their receipt after uh, registered and she would say, congratulations. And to see the smile on the faces of those who just happen to be uh, uh, incarcerated, but still having the right to vote and being reminded of that, I think are sort of one of those catalysts for change. And it really does, just seeing that interaction alone uh, made it worth it. And so to date, We've registered over 2,500 eligible voters. Of course, the population is much larger, but it, it, it's been a, a huge uptaking. And so from there, uh, I now work for Spread the Vote um, as the Director of National Partnerships. And so although COVID sort of became this thing that rocked everyone and kind of shook everything up, the silver lining is through the work that I do there, uh, there's now a national coalition with Spread the Vote, Vote.org, I know I'm going to forget somebody, but those are the two uh, main players, and we're going to register to vote and provide ballot by mail processing in 30 different states, uh, partnering where, where possible, and each of these jails are going to be essentially partners uh, for the organization. And I'm almost up on my seven minutes. It's been fun work. It's been very rewarding. It's a lot of hard work. I invite folks to go to spreadthevote.org, houstonjustice.org uh, to, to find out more. Great. Thank you so much, Darrell. And we're going to 
Um, in the uh, discussion, in the Q&A, we're going to get a chance to talk about resources and ways that people can get started if they haven't already started their own voting in jail um, effort. And so the resources that you all have at Spread the Vote, I'm sure will be very helpful to many of the folks on the call who may be interested in starting something new in their own jurisdiction. So thank you for sharing that and thank you for sharing how things got started in Houston, Harris County, where um, this work has been so important over the last few years. So now we go out further west to Denver, where we're gonna hear from Justin with the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition. Justin's a native of Denver and has worked in various ways organizing and fighting for social justice and he now serves as the deputy director for the well-regarded Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition that has been doing so much work over the last um, many years to challenge mass incarceration and also in support of a range of um, efforts to fight collateral consequences, including expanding the franchise to incarcerated residents in the Denver County Jail. So Justin, I wanna refer to you and hear from you on how things got started in Denver and how your work has um, built on ongoing efforts to challenge mass incarceration and what pivoting you all may be doing now given COVID-19. Absolutely, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me this afternoon. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you to the Sentencing Project and my fellow panelists to get the opportunity to talk about, you know, providing a meaningful way for folks who are incarcerated to register to vote and vote. And I just applaud the work that's happening across the country Right, it's just so like an honor for me to be on the panel with you guys and hear the work that you're doing as well. You know, our organization, the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, back in 2006, we launched a really small campaign um, called Can I Vote? Because in our state, in Colorado, historically, we have never practiced permanent disenfranchisement. But what we found out was that it was not well known across the state. You know, there was the operating assumptions from urban to suburban that if you had a criminal background or a felony conviction, you couldn't vote in our state. And it just wasn't true. So in 2006, we, small, we started a really small kind of public education campaign as a grassroots nonprofit organization trying to get the word out. I mean, our state's not big, don't get me wrong. We're pretty rural, however, and spread out with close to about 6 million people. But for an organization at that time that literally only had two staff, you know, the idea was how do we chip away at starting to educate the community on this? I highlight that context because fast forward since then, we've grown. We expanded and scaled out our, our campaign on educating people on their criminal, on their voting rights um, and eligibility if they are injustice involved. And within that expansion of not only just the campaign, but the staff as well, we developed a capacity as one of the only criminal justice reform organizations in the state that actually has a civic engagement arm. And that's focusing on that intersectionality. So I wanted to give some slight context there. So at that point in time, in 2016, as we continue to educate the community, we realized that there is a population of justice involved people sitting in our jails that have no idea that they are actually eligible to register to vote and vote, right? We were tackling the mass incarceration at the state level, at the prison level, but in Colorado, we have 64 counties and we have 52 county jails and all the jails are ran by the county. So when we were thinking about eligibility and the, the right to vote, we said, well, wait a minute, there's a subpopulation, not just prisons, but there's a subpopulation in jails that actually are eligible to register to vote and vote. And that would be a game changer, right, for how elections occur in our state. And so we started focusing on that. My boss had a delegated and tasked me uh, to lead the civic engagement effort and go into the jail, figure out how to penetrate and get into the jails and figure out how we can help people register to vote. Well, at that time, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I'm just gonna be full transparent. I'm like, how do I register people to vote in jails? Wait, what? So our organization, we're very research-based. We do our due diligence, we do our homework. So like any esteemed student, I started doing my homework. I started researching who was doing this across the state. How do I do this? And I came across an organization called the Ordinary People's Society, TOPS. And I said, well, who is this? You know, who are these folks? I'm relatively new to this aspect of the work. I got to meet and greet. So I reached out um, and was referred to a gentleman named Kenny Glasgow. And I talked to Glasgow and I said, hey, look, man, this is who I am. And he was like, wait, who are you? Right? And I was like, I know I'm a rookie in this, but this is who I am. How do I do this? I have no idea. And the first thing that he told me was, 
you keep justice involved people, directly impacted people, incarcerated people at the center of why you were doing this. And that's what resonated for me that I could do it. Then he laid out how they had done it in 2003 and was the first organization in the country to do any kind of jail-based voting. And he said, hey, look, I got a blueprint. I can share some resources with you, share a toolkit that we put together, take a look at it. So I started, he sent it to me. I was completely grateful for that. And I started looking at the toolkit and I said, okay, there's strategies and tactics here. And the number one thing that he told me, he said, start small. If you have 52 county jails, pick one. So at that time, of course, being Denver located, our organization is statewide nonprofit, but we're Denver centric as far as our location. Start with Denver, our metropolitan, our city and county and capital. We reached out to the Denver Elections Division first in 2016 and said, hey, there's an eligible population here. Why aren't you guys doing your job? So similar to the sister Paulina said around the sheriffs and the election clerks and the, it's their job. They should be doing it. So we preference the conversation with why aren't you doing this? Not that we should be doing this. And since you're not doing this as a reform advocacy organization, we're going to put pressure and we're going to be on that helmet to make sure that you are doing it. The minute that we had that type of conversation, then that's when the conversation called partnership sparked up. Well, we would like to partner with you because our thing is policy and legislation. So we will legislate and mandate that you should do this, but they wanted to partner. And it's been a great partnership ever since. So we partner with the Denver Elections Division and our Denver Sheriff's Department. Now I'm giving you guys top lines because I have seven minutes. It was a uphill climb, right? It wasn't easy at all. I'm just describing not the nuances of it, but the needless to say, the Sheriff's Division was like, oh, well, we kind of already do this. So we just asked for proof. They didn't have any. So we worked for about six months with the Denver Elections Division and also the Denver Sheriff's Department to put together a program called Jail-Based Voting or Confined Voting. At that point, my organization was the community-based organization in the partnership that literally designed the model to where we would go in, we had to go through clearances, we had to do similar to what Darrell was saying, we had to go through the process of certification in the state, and we launched in 2016 the first jail-based voting project, project in the state of Colorado. Well, it illustrated some success. In fact, that one general election term at, in here in Colorado in 2016, of course, you all know, that was a presidential election year, right? Um, needless to say where we're at now. But we were able to actually register close to about 700 individuals in the Denver County Jail over that period of time. And at the time, the election results, the, the county jail had a higher turnout rate than the actual city did. So we blew algorithms, they didn't understand how we did it. And for us, it was relationals because we were in there with folks that we were, we are those folks. And that was the pilot project that sparked in Colorado jail-based voting. We have since then worked with the Denver County jails and uh, several other counties in which we have launched jail-based or confined, confined voter projects in those counties. But more importantly, what it led to since we had a demonstration project that this could be done, that this is an eligible population, that what we call the invisible uh, voting block, and we emphasize it through a public communications campaign, we started spreading information and knowledge about it and informing folks to make sure that they understood that this is an eligible population. So it wasn't just the combined voter project itself. We knew we had to elevate the conversation statewide. When we did that, we caught the attention of the Secretary of State's office and some of our legislatures. So they then wanted to meet with us and we started partnering with the legislatures and the state and the Secretary of State's office to create what was rulemaking. At the time, we were going to legislate it that all 52 counties by mandate should, in, should create a meaningful opportunity in a process for people who are eligible to register to vote and vote in jail be able to do so. Well, they were scared of that as well. So the Secretary of State's office said, well, we want to work with you. And instead of legislating this, of course, separation of powers, instead of legislating this, can we create it through rulemaking? So my organization went along with a couple of coalition partners, the ACLU of Colorado, um, Common Cause of Colorado, all met with the Secretary of State's office to create rulemaking that mandated, it was called SB 250, and it mandated all county jails to provide a meaningful opportunity for folks eligible to register to vote in jail and vote. It was the first time in the history of Colorado that the Secretary of State's office actually issued a through rulemaking a mandate for county jails and county election divisions to work together and do this. Well, of course, with us being an advocacy organization, we believe in accountability. 
So we wanted to, uh, to start to uh, watchdog this particular process. And us, along with Common Cause and ACLU, have been monitoring this implementation of this rulemaking since uh, 2018 up until now to ensure that all counties were doing this. And that was the impetus of our jail-based voting project and the inspiration behind it. We had knew that this had happened across the country, but we knew that it was not happening in Colorado. The third thing that it led to as well was our continued advocacy around voter reenfranchisement and voter uh, restoration of rights. And building off the momentum of the platform of formerly or incarcerated folks being able to register to vote and vote, we then moved on legislation in 2019 that literally restored the rights of all people on parole in our state to be eligible to register to vote and vote. And that approximated that about 11 to 12,000 people were now immediately eligible to register to vote and vote who were on parole. And so we've chipped away at the edges in Colorado. It's been relatively some soft ground in the sense considering that we didn't have permanent disenfranchisement in our state. And prior to us mobilizing these particular legislation and advocacy efforts, literally the only folks that who could not vote in our state were if they were confined for a felony conviction. Other than that, a criminal record didn't matter, misdemeanor, pre-trial, none of those things matter, but it just was not well known. And of course, our ambition and our vision is to go to full restoration of rights for all incarcerated people moving forward. Our pivot to COVID, great question, Nicole. I hope I'm not burning my seven minutes, but I'll leave about 30 seconds on this. And that is, of course, with the COVID crisis, we've had to make some adjustments. And so we're still working with some of the county jails specifically, even though there's this state uh, rulemaking mandate in place, that we feel were A, it's a high population of low uh, poverty, folks in poverty, high concentration of people of color in those jails, and we're working with them. And so our pivot has been virtual. In fact, we've created jail-based videos, jail-based material, and literally created virtual ways to where they can access and register to vote in, while they're in jail. Our next step will be our Secretary of State's office just issued a new rulemaking around a grant program for ballot boxes to be placed in uh, creating new VSCPs, new voter center polls, similar to what they did in LA. Our push is going to be that those, those voter center polls be, boxes be placed in the jails as well to provide polling in the jails. And so that, in summary, is kind of what we've done in Colorado, where our inspiration has came from. You know, my dream is full, full restoration of rights and full, <laughs> and full uh, reenfranchisement of folks who are incarcerated and keeping in mind that our effort Everyone who's a volunteer and participated in our effort have been formerly incarcerated people or directly impacted people, and they should be at the center of movement in this movement of, of full reenfranchisement and restoration of rights for folks who are incarcerated. So thank you for giving me the opportunity in my seven minutes to share with you what we have done in Colorado. Thank you, Justin. And um, uh, your words are very powerful. I so appreciate you joining us this afternoon and also sharing with us how things got started in Denver and what you're doing in the context of COVID-19. I also want to apologize to you, Justin. There is an offensive comment shared in the chat. It's unacceptable. And how I know we are amongst great company are the fact that so many of our attendees who saw this offensive comment have weighed in, talking about the offensiveness of it, and then offering suggestions on ways to protect the space, ways to honor your um, commitment to restoration of rights, Justin, and challenging mass incarceration, and supporting a safe space and safe conversation, even virtually for all of us to talk about voting in jails and expanding the franchise to our incarcerated um, residents. So with that, I um, just wanna, Oh. Just do some housekeeping with Morgan. Morgan, there is a person on the call, uh, Joseph Kine, who made that offensive comment. So if there's some way to address him or, or you know, remove him from the call, I think it would be very appropriate for us to do that at this time. And let, so and let, jo and let, and let Joseph know, I'm happy to have a direct conversation with him anytime he would like. I don't shy away from any particular- I know you don't, but at the same time, this is a safe <laughs> space that we're creating for your participation. Absolutely. We're honored by your presence here. I just thought, it's yeah. that anyone would try to undermine that and, um, and complicate that. But with that, we'll move on to Dana, who is one of my wonderful new colleagues at the Campaign Legal Center. And Campaign Legal Center is co-sponsoring this webinar this afternoon with us and is committed to working with the sentencing project and other national organizations in terms of not just ensuring that people in jail can vote in any remaining primaries and in the general election, 
but also protecting those opportunities to vote and protecting access to um, the ballot leading into the general election. So Dana is a well-regarded Equal Justice Works Fellow whose um, fellowship is, spo is sponsored by Arnold and Porter Foundation. And her work has focused on jail-based voter um, disenfranchisement. And so we want to shift the call to Dana for her to share her perspective on the legal framework that underlies jail-based voting and any other resources and perspectives that she can share on behalf of the Campaign Legal Center. So Dana, thank you for your time this afternoon and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, I work at the Campaign Legal Center or CLC, where we use um, three main strategies, direct uh, outreach, advocacy, and courtroom litigation to fight jail-based disenfranchisement. And, you know, I'm a voting rights lawyer. And so I often like to say that aspirationally, my role in this is to be kind of technical support to the revolution. Like I like to work with as many folks as I can across the country, folks on this call and elsewhere, um, to try and support whatever work they're doing um, to protect ballot access for incarcerated uh, voters. And so, you know, you know, the law in this space, unlike in many, is actually a real, um, a, to a good tool here. Because so in 1974, the Supreme Court found in a case called O'Brien versus Skinner, that the state couldn't deprive people, eligible voters, of their right to vote simply because they're incarcerated. And so, you know, my general role is to kind of work with advocates on the ground or folks who are in jail, um, to make sure that the states are living up to their obligation to enfranchise voters in this position. Um, and so I think, as has been alluded to throughout this call, a lot of what this work looks like depends very heavily on your context. So, you know, in one instance, we reached out to a bunch of jails and said, hey, we want to come in, we want to do this work. And one jail completely stonewalled us, while the next was like, come in the next day, bring whatever resources you have. And so the shape that your work takes um, will change depending on that context. And so, you know, I think I, I loved what Justin said, which was that his, his project started with two people, right? Like you can be one person who sends a letter to your sheriff or your county clerk um, to ask what's going on here. And some jails, um, like the one Durrell was talking about, have 10,000 people. And, and that undertaking is quite large, but many, many jails across the states um, and in counties are much smaller than that. And so even a single person going in, starting in one place can make a huge difference. And even if you encounter a jail that says, no, you're not allowed in, there are so many ways to engage in state and local policy advocacy um, through things like administrative rulemaking and really sort of like weedsy technical things to lobby people um, at the state and local level to, to do the things that they need to do to ensure that people who are in jail can exercise their constitutional right um, to vote and participate. Um, and so at CLC, my role is to be a resource to all of you um, and to anyone who might need it. And so we try to create resources and advocacy guides and things like that that can you know, help let people know, here's some questions you should be asking. Um, here are some best practices that jails or volunteers or county clerks should be um, engaging in when they're trying to enfranchise um, eligible incarcerated voters. Um, so I also wanted to kind of zoom out a little bit and just talk about how jail-based disenfranchisement happens because when you think about the position of someone who's in jail, they rely on anyone else to give them access to information and resources. They don't have access to the internet. They don't have access to media unless someone gives them that access. And so unless someone in the jail or a third party volunteer is taking the time to let someone know, hey, there's an election coming up. Hey, you have the right to vote. Then people in jail are not gonna have access to that information. And so our role in doing this work is to ensure that that information gets out there. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about is, you know, in a large view, thinking about the impact of this work. So one of the things that I think Justin has touched on, we all have touched on, is that in many contexts, contact with the criminal justice system can disenfranchise someone. 
um, either during the duration of someone's confinement for a felony conviction, and in a few states, a very small minority of states, occasionally for um, the duration of a confinement of a misdemeanor conviction. But jails incarcerate about a third of the American incarcerated population. It's like 750,000 people are incarcerated in jails. And the vast majority of those people are there in pretrial detention. Um, and pretrial detention never affects someone's eligibility to vote. Um, and the balance of the other people who are incarcerated in jails, local jails, tend to be people who are there serving time for misdemeanors, which again, very rarely impact someone's eligibility to vote. So if you're going out and doing civic engagement work, it's very important that you arm yourself with the knowledge and resources to sort of empower people to let them know, even though you've had contact with the criminal justice system, you know, your right to vote has not been impacted. Um, and on an even larger scale, and I think it's important to talk and think about in this moment, the way that um, the systems that disenfranchise people, right, even if you're talking about voter purges, or you're talking about long lines at the polls, or you're talking about uh, prison gerrymandering, those, those things that impact, you know, what we think of as um, groups that are disproportionately disenfranchised, which is Black voters, which is Latino voters, which is Native American voters, are the same sort of systems are impacting the same communities that are over policed and over surveilled and disproportionately likely to find themselves um, in jail. And so I think the work of doing this work or the importance of doing this work is, is really thinking about what it means to make sure that our democracy is hearing all voices um, and especially those voices that have been most directly impacted by um, by decisions that elected officials make, right? Like people who are in jail have been prosecuted by an elected prosecutor, um, are being incarcerated by an elected sheriff, um, are being you know, not served by a county clerk who's not providing voter resources and ballots um, to folks in jail. And so as a matter of democratic accountability, it's, it's important that um, their voices are heard here. And so I think that that's, you know, hopefully a good overview of, of why this work is important and, and who's being impacted. Um, and as we go forward and, and through the q and I'm happy to talk more about the ways that we've seen this work play out in different states. Um, because like I mentioned, if you're in a place where you can't get access to the jail, then your work is gonna look very different than if you have a partnership that you're able to start with the sheriff's office. Um, but also, as I think Darrell well knows, um, you know, my job is often to write angry letters on fancy letterhead to try and compel people to do the things that we want them to do. And I'd be happy to write those letters um, for any of you. So um, I think that this is just the beginning of a conversation and I look forward to hearing what, what everyone has to say and how we can move this conversation forward. Angry letter writing backed up by um, someone with the JD who can help um, get things, set things in motion, particularly leading up to election day in November when it's so important that so many people will participate in the franchise in order to have a say in our democracy. So right now I'm going to ask one question and then we're going to move to some of the questions and comments that have been offered in the chat and the Q&A portion. If you haven't um, entered your question, please do so now because we'll get to them now. Um, we'll get to them in a minute. I, I do want to um, emphasize what Dana said to everyone who's weighed in in the chat. Is this happening in my area? Is the, I'd like to get something started in my city or in my town, and we want to support you. This is certainly the beginning of a conversation from here out. I think that there will be opportunities for us to have ongoing uh, strategy calls, if not video conferences via Zoom or some other platform where we talk about specific issues related to jail-based voting, how to organize a coalition, how to, um, what sort of demand letters, angry letters can Dana help support? Um, what, how to build those relationships that Ms. Pauline and Justin uh, talked about in their presentations. There are many other conversations that we can schedule between now and November to amplify the top line and key practices that have been highlighted this afternoon. And we also want to emphasize that this is no, by no means the definitive picture of all the jail-based voting efforts that are going on throughout the country. I know I noticed in the chat we have Charles Thornton from DC, 
on the webinar who has led efforts at the Washington DC jail for many years. And we have other advocates um, who have weighed in this afternoon too. So we, are, we admire all of your leadership and are thankful for your time this afternoon. So one question and then we'll move to the Q&A that some of our audience participants are asking. Justin, you already mentioned in your presentation about how you're pivoting given the context of COVID-19 and the challenges that it may pose to your jail-based voting efforts in Denver. I wanted to give an opportunity to Ms. Colleen and Darrell to see if you had anything to share with regards to that. And also Dana, if you've had any thoughts about that as well, that state coalitions or other groups might um, be thinking about. Ms. Colleen, can we start with you? Well, I guess I'll start with me because I feel like as a panelist, I just as much need um, Durrell, Justin, and Dana. I started this work 30 something years ago when it wasn't friendly, criminal justice was not a topic. So I had to push against what I didn't know because it came from a place of the heart and having the lived experience of hearing people's conversation and knowing that voting was right and voting was important to me prior to incarceration. So I had to learn the untraditional ways with knowing who was in the association of the sheriff's department and working that way. And a lot of the stuff I did, I was my own lead work with getting the sheriffs. And the most common thing that I heard in the pushback from sheriffs was, oh, they don't want that in here. They just concerned about going home. And so they didn't want to spread the information. And so a lot of the techniques and, and ways that we did stuff, like I said, was from the uh, roundabout. And right now, I think I forgot what the question was because I wanted to get that point in. Uh, Nicole, what was the question that you had? I wanted to make sure that I got that. I think you got it. Um, and then uh, you might want to return to it later, but it was about given COVID-19 and maybe any challenges going into jails or prisons in Mississippi, have, has your work shifted or are you thinking about ways to shift your uh, voting while incarcerated? Effort? Oh, it absolutely has, has shifted because the facilities are on lockdown, even in the county. Uh, all of the facilities are on state that, uh, lockdown, but our our approach is different in that we have established relationships with certain case managers, officers, lieutenants, uh, even the chairman of the parole board here. So I am a stickler for relationship building with those people who are favored among the prison and jail populations. Great. And Darrell or Dana, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I was going to say we were uh, actually on a call yesterday with our county clerk uh, where Dana's memo came in like, like handy once again. You know, they came up with this memo and it's been like our like pass or our passport to get a lot of stuff done. It gives kind of the gravitas of the, you know, like, oh, they're using these terms like this is legit. Um, but yesterday, that was literally the question that the clerk asked. He said, based on what's going on with COVID, if you had a magic wand, what, how would y'all do this in the jail? And I was like, okay. Number one, if we had a polling location, that would be great. So there's conversations around that too, around actually voting. But when it comes to registration, they have closed circuit television in the jails. And so uh, Bun B, who some people on the call may, on, on here may know. I know him. I yeah. know him. And Trey, the truth, are going to do a, they volunteered to do a PSA. Uh, are, we're hoping that's artists, guys. Yeah, they're, they're musical artists. And so they're going to, um, that's going to hopefully be high in rotation as well as uh, we need a huge printing buy. We can't just do our regular 11 by 17 black and white prints in the dormitories. We're going to have to actually do something substantive. And then additionally, even when we were go every single time we would go around, there were officers and sergeants and lieutenants and chiefs who didn't know that it was a thing. So we're ramping down and saying, hey, you've got to let this stuff permeate through your systems. If the officers and the sergeants don't know, and if these things aren't readily available, then COVID is going to put a huge speed bump in the middle of this. Or if done the right way, I'm confident we can probably get more participation this year 
uh, th than we've ever had before. And so those are the things that we're doing to, to uh, combat COVID since we can't do it um, in person. And then the last thing that I'll add, we're working on sort of a pen pal system where the same way you go and you knock on doors or you ring doorbells, you make phone calls, we can write people who are in jail and we can, we can provide prompts for people who have relatives in jail to sort of start those conversations, right? And vice versa to where they can write outside the jail to where we keep this uh, on the, in, the, in the conversation. And Dana, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I guess just quickly, I think COVID-19 exacerbates every single factor that makes voting from jail difficult, right? Like jails are on lockdown. And so to the extent that community volunteers used to be a part of this effort, it's much harder for them to continue to be a direct part of, of the effort. Um, you know, mail is slower. Everything is slower. Everything is, is harder. Um, and so I think that you know, and I, and I loved also that I think Justin made this point and Miss Pauline, this is, you know, obviously a part of her work too. In a lot of places, you know, part of what makes some of these efforts really great is it's people speaking to their own communities, right? Like this work is led by formerly incarcerated people who are coming into a jail and speaking to people in a position where they've been and that becomes much harder in COVID-19 and so I think when we're thinking about policy and we're thinking about what are we asking from and demanding from sheriffs and county clerks it's a floor like what we want them to be is a backstop like you need to be able to be providing people a minimum of ballot access a minimum of information to elections uh, or on how to vote and then you should be working with community partners to build out that infrastructure to ensure that there is community support and community connection um, during ordinary times when it is safer to have people come into the jail. Um, and so that, that's kind of what I would say, but I think, again, all these things are really dependent on the size of your jail, the jurisdiction you're working in, um, and you know, what you can do, um, what kind of flexibility you have there. Great, thank you, Dana. Can I jump in and say something real quick, Nicole? And Justin, you too, if you have anything to add as well. But go ahead, Ms. Pauline. One of the things the the street tactic to some of this that do is with the relationship with the sheriff. I would get the sheriffs involved and say, look, you your re-election is coming back around. Have, not pushing them to vote for the sheriff, but when you present it to the sheriff from that perspective, they take more of a greater interest with figuring out the methodology and sometimes have helped me use and one sheriff that's dead and gone off stayed in his seat when it was presented to him that way he had the largest number of participants that i, I ended up coming out of the equation you're not saying that they're going to vote for you but it would be to your best interest to make it you know easy because you just never know and then throw a little pizza or something on the side you know to enhance that and i'm i'm just saying it worked i, I believe it miss pauline because you've been doing it a long time justin did you have anything to add and then we'll get to one of these questions absolutely just real quickly i would say as well provided the COVID, i would encourage folks on the call to research the statutes in your state and see if they're already required to do this because part of it is COVID is a barrier for us as activists and advocacy groups being able to provide programmatic support to these jails and going into the jails and that's idea. But COVID has created that barrier. So if there are statutes, policies, procedures that's in your state that actually require that there's a meaningful access and opportunity for people to be able to vote, then you push the jails to be in compliance with the law. And that's another advocacy point that you can do. If you can't physically get in there, then you apply pressure on the advocacy side and say they're out of compliance with the statute, they're out of compliance with the law, and we demand that they get in compliance. And that's another conversation you can have with county uh, sheriff's associations, with your lawmakers, or any of your policy folks that are on the ground that you're working with, whether you're organizing activists or an advocacy organization. Great, thank you. And I think the legal resources offered through the campaign legal center and other legal services organizations can help support advocates who need um, to make those cases and need to use those resources in engaging with sheriffs and other elections of county elections officials in their jurisdiction 
So Morgan, um, can you help field some of these questions? I know many have come in while we've been talking. I, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a lot for me to sort of keep on track of, so I don't know if there's one or two questions that we can get to before we wrap up the webinar. I will say that I think it's been mentioned, I'll, I'll restate it again, this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, there have been several comments or questions wondering if this is happening in their jurisdiction or if it's not, can they get help? The answer is yes. And the answer is we don't know and yes. So we don't know. So you can reach out to Dana or I, our emails are offered here. We will be happy to follow up with you. And then we will also be happy to connect you with some how to get started resources. And then between now and November, as was stated earlier, this, this conversation will continue either through conference call or other Zoom meetings where we will identify best practices and also figure out ways to support folks who are attempting jail-based voting efforts and may need help troubleshooting or identifying ways to convince stakeholders in their jurisdiction, whether it be the sheriff or the county jail, um, you know, the person who runs the county jail or the county elections boards to support the franchise for people who are eligible to vote in uh, county jails or local jails around um, the country. Uh, so Morgan, are there any questions that we can um, ask before we wrap up? Sure, um, just a big one that lots of people have sent is how to get involved. A lot of people have shared their email address. They wanna know who else is working on this issue and if a working group could get started. And I don't know if Nicole, if you, if we wanna collect some of these email addresses afterwards, uh, people who are interested, the chat will be saved. Um, so if people wanna share that and we can maybe follow up, or Nicole, you can talk. Yeah, I think absolutely we'll do. And we will follow up with an email with the link to this recorded webinar. And again, Dan and I are offering to organize and establish conversations between now and November that can help support ongoing efforts. So yeah, please do share if you're interested your email in the in the chat or in the Q&A. But also we'll follow up over email and you have our emails. Look mm -hmm. at the screen. You have our email so you can reach out directly to myself, I'm Nicole, or Dana, and we'll follow up with you directly. Okay, some other questions. What mechanisms exist for tracking jail-based registration and voting? Question. I think. Go ahead, Dana. It, I also, Justin. No, no, please go ahead. So I was gonna say, um, you know, one of, I think your best friends here, if you're, right, there's the carrot and the stick. They're, we're gonna work collaboratively or we're gonna, <laughs> come in and try, and try and be more forceful. And I think one of the best tools that you all have at your disposal too is public records requests. So you can send public records requests to your county clerk and your county jail and ask um, under, under state law, you, they have an obligation to disclose to you what their policies are and you know how many people have voted from jail and, and things like that. Some of them don't necessarily keep numbers on stuff like that, um, although they should. And so I don't think that there's any sort of centralized tracking mechanism that you can use, but um, th that, that information is out there and it should be available by public records request. Next question. Um, is there any data on a decrease in recidivism and or increase in voting due to individuals being able to vote while they are incarcerated? While they're incarcerated, no. There is one study in we can, that you can find at the Sentencing Project website that's linked to in our felony enfranchisement primer that connects um, voting as a range of pro-social um, activity that reduces recidivism of just, amongst justice-involved residents. Um, so that's one research study that we're aware of that makes connections to voting and re reductions in recidivism. I don't know if, Dan, if you're aware of anything else specific to in-person, I mean, sorry, to currently incarcerated residents who are also voting. Not that I'm aware of, though. Dana shaking her head down. But it's something to be studied and explored for the person who asked that great question. We do know of impacts on recidivism in the community, but it's something to be studied for people who are currently incarcerated and who also vote. 
I, I, I also, there was also a recent study out of um, MIT that I know Nicole cites in her report and is cited elsewhere about how even short stays, um, short incarcerations in jails for misdemeanor convictions can lead to long-term lack of participation. People are less willing to vote and participate in the future. And that's an effect that's particularly exaggerated amongst black men. And I think that that study is, you know, further evidence of like why this work is so important because keeping people engaged and, you know, doing the work of telling them that their voice matters when they're in a position that is so disempowering by design, I think um, can be important in sort of, you know, keeping, keeping people um, engaged. The next question is, what about the issue of residency to vote? Many incarcerated men and women don't have a permanent address and have to provide proof of residency. And just to follow up, somebody else asked, do you need to change your address if you're voting from jail? Dana, can you, uh, Justin, maybe you had something to say. And I could share that perspective from Colorado. I know in, in our state, um, the first part, the latter of that conversation of do you need to change your address while you're in jail, I'll start with the, the end of that particular, the, the second part of that question. In Colorado, we encourage folks to change their address to the actual jail location if they're going to be in jail at the time of voting, right? So on the registration form, they have to put their permanent address and the address where they want to receive their ballot. And so tactically, what we do is we have them change their address if they are literally going to be there, especially those who are there for misdemeanor convictions and can only in our state, in our county jails, the length of stay in a county jail, the maximum is 18 months. And so if they perceive themselves to be there, then we encourage them to change their residence, their address for their ballot to the actual jail itself. The first latter part of the, of the, of the question around residency, we have them identify the residency in reference to prior to them being incarcerated. Right, and so therefore, they that that um, certifies that they are a Colorado resident, whatever that, that residency was, and whichever county that residency was in. And so, our elections division are mandated and responsible for even if they receive a ballot that's not in the particular the county that they're in. If it's Denver, they have to send that ballot by law to the to the respective county. So that's how it works in Colorado. They can actually put down the residency prior to them being incarcerated. If that residency has changed, they perceive themselves as being released a day two or a week prior to election. Colorado has same day registration. Um, as far as voting is the same day voting and same day registration, then we encourage them to list what they perceive their new residential address would be if they're going to be um, released from jail. And so that's the process in Colorado um, specifically. And then Sorry, did I have a Oh, I was gonna say, I know, uh, so so for two of the questions, one, there's like the Voter Action Network, which is like banned. So anyone who's a registered voter, that's public info. And usually what campaigns do, when you get those calls and you haven't voted yet, they know you haven't voted because they've run that list. It's really easy to get um, with your county clerk or if you know someone to access the ban. And then we were just talking about uh, voting addresses for people in jail. A lot of people in jail are sometimes homeless. So in those instances, we'll do what Justin just said, but there are certain cases where someone's actual address will actually be in a district where yeah. their vote could shift the ballot and they want to vote in that district. And there's a way to do that too in Texas, but every state there's a different way, literally a different way to do it. Yeah. And Dara, if I can piggyback on that in Colorado, folks who are homeless, we have them identify a cross street or a shelter that they can use as their address as well. And to your point, as far as the van is concerned, if you have voter access network in your state, you can literally run reports on who registered to vote. We track it internally to see if they're coming from the jails, whichever jails that we are doing the work in, we match it with the van, we list match it, and to see if they actually turn out the vote. So that's also, to your point, Daryl, uh, Darrell, sorry, Darrell, um, another way to uh, track uh, who's voting from jail and who's not. I want to say something to that same thing about the address situation. Uh, Justin and Darrell have already alluded to it. We uh, have a transitional home, and our transitional home has become address to a lot of these people who were homeless or those who uh, ran into situations where 
the resident refused the mail from where they came from and it was sent back to the county court. Then we had to do a letter of, 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 of uh, identifying the address. We had to give a letter for that to the transition home and it was uh, acceptable by the clerk. Um, any advice on how to utilize slash promote vote by mail for incarcerated eligible voters? And also another question around drop boxes. Um, have any states had success getting drop boxes in jails? Um, if I could, I, so I'm going to jump in a little bit and say that. So I think that, um, and I think actually we talked about, and Nicole's mentioned this before, that we're going to be sending out resources. And this is sort of the beginning of a conversation. Um, we put together a manual, like an advocacy manual for um, people who are interested in doing jail voting advocacy. And so the reason I, I bring that up is because just as this last question that was asked illustrates is every single thing is different um, depending on what state you're in and even what county you're in. And so before we can answer a question like what is the address of residence, you know, we need to do some due diligence and stuff like that first. And so, you know, in some jurisdictions where, for example, they have like a really great system, like a polling place in a jail, they're not really going to want to use vote by mail in a jail. And in other jurisdictions, they will only be relying on vote by mail. And we're going to want to push the jail to do more than that. Because, you know, in a lot of states, you have to request a ballot by a certain deadline. And so everyone who's arrested and incarcerated after that deadline passes is by default dis um, disenfranchised. And so, you know, when we're thinking about what solutions we're bringing to the jail and what um, what jail voting advocacy looks like in our context, we should be considering that whole universe of possibilities, vote by mail, drop boxes, and things like that. And I think, you know, many jurisdictions do use some kind of a drop box. Um, you know, those those kinds of solutions work best when the clerk and the sheriff are working together to ensure that the drop box gets picked up you know, in a timely way that people know about it um, and can use it. Um, but all of those things really depend on, you know, whether a solution like that makes sense, um, given the sort of size of the jail, given the size of the jurisdiction and, and all of that other stuff. And so, you know, I think as, as you think about what would make sense in your, you know, locality, the place where you live, um, you know, part of it is asking the right questions and, and, you know, looking around at what makes sense for you. Yeah, and I, and I would just add, I think the research side of this, to Dana's point, is super important, you guys. You know, um, one of the things in continued research, I know recently, um, again, Alabama's been definitely a pace car for a lot of this, but they just currently uh, passed a measure where they can do absentee ballot for incarcerated folks, right? And so that's one mechanism as well as ensuring also, ensuring that folks get ballot. If, if they are incarcerated, they can receive an absentee ballot. I think they're the first in the country to do that as well, right? So again, looking at mechanisms that can give people meaningful access um, to being able to get their ballot in jail and be able to cast their ballot is vitally important. It also mitigates the COVID, COVID epidemic and that barrier as well. So to Dana's point, I just think that continued resource, I mean, continued research on how to figure out who's doing what over the country in reference to access to voting in these jails is super important. What are the mechanisms? How do we continue to push, whether it's what Alabama did in with TOPS in Alabama with absentee ballots, or whether it's polling and polling centers inside the jails like they did in LA. It's like there's multiple strategies. Find the one that's custom fit to what your capacity is to do, how you're resourced to do it, how you can move the political landscape and really push for it. Great, great way to frame that, Justin. Morgan, should we wrap up or do you want to ask one more question and then we'll wrap up the call? Um, we can, there's still some people on, so we can ask one more question. Um, let's see. Um, there's some questions around, um, how do we encourage interest and participation among residents at the jail and how do we identify who is registered or who is eligible and not eligible? I don't know if you want to respond. I want to jump in and pick, uh, say that, go back to what Darrell was saying about the writing, the pen pal, and we have, our organization has the Freedom Letters campaign that we intentionally write every single person that's incarcerated, whether federal, state, county, detention centers, community work centers, um, uh, even those that are on um, 
uh, house arrest, which is community, same as community, where we send it out. We just send, and we do this for special events. We like all month of June, all the men that's incarcerated will get, some of them will get it after Father's Day. All the men, whether they have a biological child or not, they will get a Father's Day card. And we intentionally center it around, okay, it's voted. Make sure that you get your family members in the county. We get them to help us spread the word. And sometimes they do it a whole lot better. But don't cancel out the writing piece of this. And if I may, I would just say to the, to the last question, how do you make sure folks who are incarcerated are actually engaged? If I heard the question correctly, I can just share with you three things that I thought was key to our campaign. One was messaging. Right, so how you get residents who are in the jail, even though regardless of their condition, regardless of their circumstance, I found it profoundly amazing when we went in, how, how many of those folks actually wanted to vote, actually didn't know that they had the right to vote. So again, it's important to research in your state, your county, um, however your, your, your structure is made up in, in, in the area where you want to do the work, what are the actual laws? What are the eligibility? CCGRC, we produced a palm card, a five by seven palm card that basically says eligibility and rights that literally bullet by bullet lets them know who is eligible and who is not if they're justice involved. You wanna produce that material to where folks are educated when you go into jails, if they're registered or not. Cause in, I mean, if they're eligible to register or not. In our state, it's a class five felony if they actually register and they're not eligible. So again, your messaging, your material, that's one way you engage those residents. The second way that you engage those residents, because often what you're gonna hear if you haven't initiated a project like this, and I, I judge my panelists can attest to this, is they're gonna to wanna to know who, who do I vote for? Why should I vote, right? One of our key messagings in our state is literally DAs are elected to, I think uh, Dana's earlier point and Pauline's earlier point. You, what, what is the incentive? DAs are elected. Most folks who are in confined and incarceration immediately know who a prosecutor is, Right, so your messaging again, it entices them and encourages them. And then the third that I found that was really super helpful, engaging people who are on the inside, getting them to vote, regardless of the situation, is resources. You don't go in just with the GOTV DRD message. You go in saying, what do you need? Contact our organization. Make sure you connect with us on reentry services. In the state of Colorado, we got over 47 community-based reentry services programs through legislation that we passed that 70% of those staff are all formerly incarcerated people. So we make sure we let them know we're not just here to get you to register to vote. We're here for when you come out. And those are the three key things, I think, to your question, Morgan, um, that I have found that really incentivizes residents, I don't like to say residents in jail because that ain't their permanent residency, folks who are confined, right? Folks who are confined, hey, not only can you vote, but here's why you should vote. And if you need anything when you're coming out, let us know, continue that relationship building. It usually, usually encourages them, regardless of their sentence, regardless of their situation, to register to vote and vote. I'll also thank you, Justin, for that. I'll also point folks to the Voting in Jails report published by the Sentencing Project. You can find it at sentencingproject.org. It mentions in Chicago, for example, a civic education program for incarcerated folks to learn about voting and um, their ability to participate in the franchise. And then I've seen in the chat that other um, participants have also talked about jail-based civic education uh, efforts as well. So there's a civic education, a civic engagement effort in the DC County jails that Charles Thornton has mentioned. And I know the folks in Philadelphia are very proud of their civic-based, um, jail-based voting education efforts, as well as the folks in Chicago. And it sounds like between Justin and Ms. Pauline and Darrell, that there's work going on around civic engagement in many county jails and local jails around the country. So Morgan. Yes. Where are we? We're past the two, we're past the hour. Past the hour, um, so I don't know if you want me to ask more questions or if you would like to wrap. I, mean, I could talk about Joe Bezoding all day, <laughs> and I don't. Know, but I, I want to be respectful of our panelists' time, and you know, we did just ask them to be available for an hour. It is, it is wonderful to see the enthusiasm, and that we still have well over a hundred people who are still on this call. Um, so that's great to know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so everyone has asked, the uh, recording will be um, posted online afterwards, and I'm going to send all the reg registrants and attendees uh, a link to the recording. 
Um, we apologize for the inappropriate comment. And I know some people couldn't get on until later, but um, please feel free to share all of your email addresses and we will follow up. Um, we'll have Nicole follow up. So yes. You will have me follow up. Mm -hmm. And Dana's gonna help me too. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you all. Uh, Nicole, do you have anything else? Just that we've said it many times, this is the beginning. We wanna support voting in jails well into the November election and beyond because they're, you know, for every future election. So thank you all for your leadership in this issue. Thank you to Dana, to Justin, to Darrell, to Ms. Pauline for joining the sentencing project this afternoon. Thank you, Dana and Campion Legal Center for your co-sponsorship of this virtual um, conversation and to be continued. I think Dana and I have a lot of work to do and we are all in in supporting efforts to help expand the franchise to those incarcerated in jails leading into the November election. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.